Okay. So I'll show you. I'll show you the clip here, and then President Warren will get here uh, here shortly, and we'll kind of see where it goes and what his plans are. So uh, we'll all we'll all learn. So this was what he said. Seventy-four. Clip from President Warren. The following five-minute program has been paid for by the Boren for Governor Committee. Now, here are the candidates. Hello, I'm David Boren. A few weeks ago, one state television station invited all the Democratic candidates to appear in a face-to-face -face debate. I accepted that invitation because I think it's important that the people have a chance to see the candidates side by side facing the same issues in a debate. I believe very strongly in the people's right to know. I'm sorry to say that the other two Democratic candidates did not accept the invitation to appear and debate the issues. I'm sorry they weren't there. There are a number of questions that I would like to have asked these candidates. For example, if Governor Hall had been there, I would like to have said, Mr. Hall, I'd like to know why you signed bills into law which spent almost $2 million on a new airplane and on tunnels to get the state employees across the street at a time when we were shorting our medical center $1.5 million at a time when we would not spend the $1 million I proposed to establish residencies for more family practice doctors to help the rural areas of the state. And I'd like to have asked Mr. McSpadden, why, after 18 years of inaction in the state Senate, did he only start talking about changing the inheritance tax, the unfair inheritance tax on the women of this state, after I did something about it in the legislature this past year? I'd like to have asked both of the candidates, both Mr. Hall and Mr. McSpadden, one's been governor, the other's been in office 20 long years. I'd like to have asked them why neither one of them came forward and supported my efforts for open committees in the state legislature, supported my efforts to make all of the votes in the committees a matter of public record so that the people could find out what was happening to the important bills that were being killed in House and Senate committees. Neither one of them raised a finger. In fact, Mr. McSpadden, after 18 years in the state Senate of inaction on this issue, even continued to vote for closed committee meetings in Congress. I believe very strongly that we need new leadership in Oklahoma. I believe that we need a governor who will stick his neck out and take a stand, not one who waits to see how the wind is blowing on the issues before he tells the people where he stands. I'm ready to face the issues. I want to take responsibility as governor of this state for what needs to be done. I want to be accountable to you, the people. This is not the time to avoid the issues. This is not the time for negativism. This is the time to talk about positive leadership. This is the time not to run down our country or to run down our state. This is the time for all of us as citizens to talk about what we can do to make Oklahoma a better place to live. This is the time for all of us to rally and realize our responsibilities as citizens. There are things that I want to do for Oklahoma. I want to invest the next four years of my life in serving as your governor because I want to see us change the welfare system the abuses under it, a system that's taking one dollar out of every three that comes into state government, and yet our old people and the disabled in this state are not getting enough to live on in these inflationary times. They're not getting enough to buy the food and the medicine and the clothing that they need. This is a disgrace. It needs to be changed. And at the same time that we're depriving our old people of what they really need, we have young, able-bodied people who ought to be working for any check that they draw. We're wasting them, too. We should have them in training and work programs. We're wasting valuable human resources in this state. It's time for positive action. Let's think about the good things that we can do. Let's think about the positive things that we can do. I need your help to be elected. With your help, with your help, I can and I will win. It's time for a change. If you're tired of the old guard politics, it's time to help David Boren clean up Oklahoma. Hall has had his chance as governor. McSpadden has had 20 long years to do something. You can help David Boren sweep out the old guard. Vote for David Boren, Democratic candidate for governor. This program has been paid for by the Boren for Governor Committee. It's interesting why it's the first time I've seen that, so you guys have sat through the lecture so far. What, what has changed what President Warren talked about? How many of these points have we talked about in the lecture so far? Huh? All of them, yeah. This is pretty much a point by point what, what he's talked about. What are, what are some examples he's given in class? And we talked about kind of in length about some of these issues. 
WPA. WPA. What about the WPA? Yeah, but I mean, what, what, what were some of the things? You're right. The WPA. This is one of the things that he's talked about. But how, how does WPA pl play in? What are you know something he talked about with Roosevelt? What one of the one of the big motivators that President Bourne talked about with, with President Roosevelt in the WPA? This idea of not just giving out checks, essentially, you know, the welfare checks, but instead having them do what? Having have, have people do what for the, for the checks? Work. Work. And what kind of work did they do? Was it what they were trained in or perhaps what they had done prior to the, to the economic decline? A work, whatever it might have been. It may have been building sidewalks. It may have been building buildings, right? But it was to give this idea of self-worth. So that's, that was a key point. Um, talk about you know that to, to great extents as well you know throughout the lectures and so there are a lot of key points in there that President Bourne has talked about hasn't really changed he's not somebody they can go back and say well this guy hasn't hasn't always talked about you know he's flip flop President Bourne certainly hasn't done that you know for a pretty long long time so <laughs> so uh, we should be all together and talk about at the scholar leadership breakfast we just, for you to see ancient times <laughs> advertising has certainly gotten a little bit uh, more sophisticated. Hadn't it? But uh, I just decided that since no one, you know, I wasn't, uh, I was running so far behind that they wouldn't come and debate me because uh, they didn't want to give me any airtime and any attention. So we just had our own debate and it was a lot of fun. John Spence is here today and, and he, he's going to film some of class. So we'll just, uh, for the historic archive, uh, over in the archives here, they have all my old TV ads. Please don't go look at them. The one you saw should be enough. I'm sure you won't be tempted after looking at the one you saw. But it was kind of fun, you know, to write the questions. And I used to write all my own scripts. I remember the last year I ran for re-election in the Senate, I interviewed some, quote, political consultants. Uh, and those are people that oversee all your ads, print media, electronic media, et cetera. Of course, in, in those days, we didn't use uh, Facebook and YouTube and all of that. It was, it was nearly all direct mail, uh, newspaper, print ads, radio, uh, television spots. But I interviewed them all and they ranged from wanting to charge me $750,000 to over a million dollars. That's before you bought it in time. Now it would be probably running for the Senate, I'm sure it's probably a million and a half now uh, in a state the size of Oakland. That's just for your political consultant. And they help you by uh, not only buying the time and understanding where you'd have the most market impact, but mainly they spend a lot of time telling you what your message ought to be and how you ought to frame it and what your scripts ought to read like. And as Johnny knows, um, I didn't ever believe in that. I thought, well, if I have to hire someone to tell me what I ought to be saying when I'm running for office or what I believe in or whatever, I'm in the wrong line of work. I, I need to let someone that knows why they want to be senator or governor to run. So I was wrote on my own. And that was nice because I saved them. Like the last time I ran, I saved over about a million dollars by doing it myself and writing my own scripts. So I'm embarrassed to tell you, even I had a lot of testimonials from people. Here's why I'm voting for David Moore. I wrote their scripts too, just to make sure they didn't say anything the wrong things. But um, and then we'd find some nice music. I used to steal nice music, usually guitar music or something, as background sounds from other spots of other candidates I liked. I'd go through the archives and then I'd write the scripts and then. Uh, Johnny would produce them and film them and so on. Um, John Spence, why don't you stand up? Uh, well, you can't see if I stand up. <laughs> well, I know, but uh, there he is right here. But So you all can get to say hello to him uh, on your way out today. And, uh, and then we had Pete Rosier who uh, worked with us and he, he did the bind because I didn't know which stations, which hours, which time was the most cost effective. But as you can see back then, you could buy uh, five minute programs and you could buy 30 minute programs and um, so you could really go in depth on a particular issue and there were times when I when I had 30 minute programs and I think I told you sometimes they, they were live we were we, we were on live television with like 30 minutes and I, I uh, remember one time I was in uh, Lawton and we had a, a, a you know ask ask the candidate questions uh, period, 30, 30 minutes we paid for, and we didn't have very many resources then, so every program had to be a 
home run. And uh, so we had all these people in the audience that were fairly well picked in the audience. I mean, I, we didn't have anyone sitting in the audience who was one of my enemies or somebody that was for another candidate. We had basically our supporters in a big studio audience like that, and they're paying you. Now, now the people of southwestern Oklahoma will get to question, you know, David Bourne running for governor, or David Bourne running for senator, or what I think this is the governor's right. And so, in the middle of, of it, we had one or two quick questions that were good and right to the point, and gave me a good chance to answer them. Um, one of the things that I was, uh, uh, was in my, and I, I don't know, it wasn't in that one, I don't think, but one of the things I ran on was, uh, women used to be taxed uh, with inheritance tax. Let's say they ran a business together with their husband or they ran a farm together with, with husbands. The husband died. The wife was treated as if she never contributed anything to the well-being of the family or earning the income or anything else, even though they were, well, especially in farm families, totally partners. And so I changed the law to say that the partnership, the role women play, should be recognized. So no more inheritance taxes on widows. Uh, if the husband died, vice versa, but it was usually the husband who died first, the widow would owe no inheritance tax because the idea was after all. She helped her, she helped put it together. She contributed to the family stability, all the things. So it was called the unfair widow's tax, that's what I called it. And it was very, it was a very popular idea. And by the way, it was the first bill that I got passed in the state legislature when I was governor. It was right at the top of my platform along with open government and uh, the open meetings law, which sometimes OU Daily raises questions about whether we follow it or not. Well, I wrote it, you know. One of the things, you, you, you write a law, you, you should put yourself in the position of living under the law to make sure it's a good law. I think it's a good law. It used to be you didn't have to, you didn't have to uh, list your campaign contributors or how much they gave. So none of us would ever have any idea of knowing who the, where's the money coming from? So we might have an idea of who might be influencing the governor or senators. We, we changed those things. But this, I think it was the widow's tax, uh, came up with this real elderly man. He was 91 years old. He was obviously the oldest man there. He was a farmer. He was in his bib overalls. He looked like central casting from a movie. Um, and so with only eight minutes gone in our 30-minute program, and this was live, he got up. And he was from Fletcher, Oklahoma. Is anyone, how many of you know where Fletcher is? Anyone know? Yeah? Anybody else? Well, it's down in, it's down in southwestern Oklahoma. And not, not real far from Lawton. And um, he got up and he started talking. And he rambled and he rambled around. And he told about knowing my grandfather when the family first came in a covered wagon to be there, and then how then one of my uncles became his minister, and another one of my uncles was the school superintendent, and knowing my father, and all of this, and I'm this, we had 30 minutes. 22 minutes, 21, 20, 19, I just watched the clock tick down while he made a speech, and uh, just rambled all over the place, like people that are 91 by me tend, tend, to, tend to do, and, uh, so finally, you kept trying, you couldn't get the hook. I mean, you know, if we'd insulted this 91-year-old man, who, by the way, knew everybody, every, he was just a well-known character all through Southwest Oklahoma, it would have been terrible if someone had just gone up and shut him up, or if I'd said, yes, thank you very much, would you sit down? Said, no, you couldn't do that. So the program was coming to an end. Finally, we had to say, uh, I can't remember his name, Mr. Rainwater or something like that. I said, uh, Mr. Rainwater, it's been wonderful to have you on and all of us admire you so, but they've just shown me the signal that we have only 45 seconds left in the program, so we're all going to have to stop now, and I just simply have this opportunity to thank you all for being here and asking me questions, and you know, I gave like a 30-second soundbite about why I hope they elect me governor, and it was over. Well, I thought it was a disaster, just a disaster. Everybody went home. Oh, you know, we went away thinking it was just terrible. Well, the polling data indicated that in the next three days in southwestern Oklahoma, I went up by 25 points. And, and the program was a disaster. And so everywhere I went, you know, I'd be going up down the street, handing up my leaflet, and these people would say, 
I didn't know who you were until I heard Chester Rainwater talking about you on that program that was on this night. He's such a wonderful man, I'm going to vote for you. So it turned out to be, <laughs> turned out to be a huge success. But you know, in this day of absolutely canned advertising and everything being so programmed, and uh, I remember, and I, this is not a political statement, we had, we had Mitt Romney up at the Health Sciences Center three years ago to speak, I think. And I was just, he was, every word was programmed. Even, even if he, he drove, I drove him to the airport and there's the two of us in the car, it was like, you knew exactly what it was. He made a speech to me in the car. I mean, everything was totally programmed. Nothing was left to sort of uh, happen just sort of on its own in, in real time. But that was definitely not the way it was then. So we had a lot of fun uh, things that happened, unexpected things that happened. And, and the great thing was, can you imagine now? Now we can't, you can't even buy minute spots very often. Or, or two, most of our a lot of them were two minute spots, and five minutes. And you certainly can't buy a thirty minute program anymore. And the thought is, nobody would watch a thirty minute political program where you really get down into issues and you discuss things in detail, which is which is kind of sad. And it's the same thing with the news bites on the evening news and presidential campaigns. If you go back. 30 years ago, and we're going back uh, near the time that this was, the great, the, that program that you saw this morning with me in it, looking a little different. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the average at that time for uh, national news covering, say, a speech by a presidential candidate, they would cover, I think it was a minute 45 seconds of somebody's speech, I'd say, you know, Jimmy Carter was speaking at such and such a place, or whoever it was that was running, Gerald Ford, or you know, whomever. Um, and um, it would be a long snap. Now it's down to nine seconds is the average that you get on the evening news of what a presidential candidate said. So it's becoming harder and harder for us to be in. Infomercials are rare in politics anymore. So anyway, well. Uh, and so we're going to, do I have to put on a mic or anything for you? Okay. Um, uh, you're going to be on, you'll be in the archives now. So uh, um, uh, over in the, is it called Canada Archive? I think the political plan. We have the largest, at OU, we have the largest archive of political advertising in the entire United States. In fact, perhaps in the world, because we have also not only just candidates in the United States, we have candidates in British elections, we have candidates in Canadian elections, Mexican elections, and so on, but mainly American elections. And so when the networks or other people are uh, CNN, Fox, <coughs> whoever it is, when they're trying to get film clips, historic film clips, showing, you know, whoever it was, Richard Nixon, whatever, uh, John Kennedy, they, they come here, and this is where they find the actual clips, because this is the largest archive. So I've thought of you know, burning it down, at least a portion of it that has me in there sometimes. Uh, but some of my less sophisticated approaches, but uh, afraid it's all still there. Just remember, whatever you do now even more, uh, you, you can't ever get rid of it if you, if you put it out there. But uh, no, it was fun. We had a good time. And, uh, and I, I hope more candidates will start writing their own things, because after all, you shouldn't have to have someone to tell you what you believe in. Uh, that ought to be a matter that, that's very clear, or you shouldn't be running. Well, we talked about the difference between the House and the Senate. We started talking about uh, several things. Uh, Zachary Burgess, Zach Burgess, what, we, what the difference between the House and the Senate? What are some of the differences we've talked about? Uh, well, the size of the House and Senate. The size, and how does that affect things? Well, no, because if it's large, but, you know, here you are with 435 people, right? You don't get to know each other very much. And interpersonal relationships make a huge difference, right? Yeah. You know, you, you know people, you know people as friends. You'll be, you know, you may not agree politically, but if they're friends, you're going to try to meet them halfway. You're going to try to not do them any harm. And I used to see members of the Senate a, a lot. I remember one time when Max Bacchus, who's now a senator, was the first uh, 
he was uh, first a senator his first year, and they have a lot of horses in Montana, and there was a bill up that had to do with taxing horses, and he clearly misunderstood it. And he was about to vote on the wrong side. I mean, he was going to get taken apart in Montana. He was a Democrat. There was a Republican senator from Kentucky named John Sherman Cooper. And I remember him walk, which has a lot of horses, obviously. And he walked over to Max and he said, Max, don't vote that way. Let me tell you, here's the, here's the facts. And you're going to hurt yourself because the horse people want you to vote no. And you're about to vote yes. So he changed his vote. There was one member of another party trying to help somebody else, and that was in the Senate, where people, you know, if you're on a committee, even in the House, even a subcommittee has 25 members. In the Senate, it's not at all usual to have five members. Are you going to shout at each other across the table if there are only five of you, and you're sitting there trying to get something done? No, you get to know each other, and you work together. But in the House, it's just, it's just enormous. And, and what they do generally is if they see somebody getting ready to vote wrong, because after all, they have a form of friendship with them, they'll know them if they're in the other party. Most of them can't even name, say, a third of the other members of Congress that are not in their own party. Uh, I've tried that out on my son, and he knows a whole lot more because he votes almost as many times on one side of the party divide as the other. And they just don't know each other. And so what they do now, they call up let's say if it's a Republican that a Democrat sees as voting wrong, they call up the Democrat, instead of going over to him and saying, hey, you're going to hurt yourself because you're a friend, um, I don't want to see you do it, they call up the Republican National Committee, or the Democratic National Committee, as the case might be, and say, hey, Senator so-and-so, or Representative so-and-so, just cut their throat, they voted for this thing that is just really unpopular in their home state and in their district. That'd be a great 30-second spot against them in the next election. So they sit right there on the same committees and subcommittees, and they're calling in any votes they see the other person take that they think will be unpopular, and they help, they put that in the file. And when election time comes around, the political consultants and all the people look at that, oh, that's a great 30-second attack spot. He or she voted for this thing that's going to really hurt their state. So instead of helping each other, working together, giving friendly advice like John Sherman Cooper gave to Max Bacchus, they, they use it as an opportunity, oh, here's an attack spot, I'll phone it into the party headquarters. Happens all the time. And how well does that then cause them to work together? <laughs> Not well. They're very suspicious of each other. Um, and so size really makes a difference, size in terms of the relationships that are formed. What about the amount of attention you get if, it, if you're a senator or a house member? More attention is a senator, right? Because there are not many of you. Very often I was in a situation because it was to be a small committee, like in the Finance Committee on President Clinton's budget. Uh, it was 11 Democrats and 9 Republicans. So in a committee that small and that closely divided, there's a very good chance you'll be the swing vote. You will determine, kind of like the Supreme Court right now, nearly all their decisions are 5 to 4. And who is it that is the swing justice usually? Sometimes on the five, sometimes you know, on this side, sometimes right, sometimes left. Who's the swing justice? Kennedy. Justice Kennedy, yeah, who we had to here uh, not too long ago. Um, if I'd known he was going to write the opinion on strip searches and, uh, and also the, which says, did you know the Supreme Court now just allows you to be strip searched even if you just did, don't stop completely at a stop sign? Uh, or if you violate the leash law with your dog or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It can be the least, most trivial offense, and they have to show no cause, no reason to believe you're hiding anything, and they can strip search anybody. Uh, interesting thing will be when the justices don't have it in their robes and don't stop completely at the stop sign there on, by, uh, on Independence Avenue or whatever it is by the court, and they get hauled over and strip searched. Uh, that'll be interesting to see how they react and if they think that's, uh, that's what our rights and liberties should be, how they should be defined. Uh, and look at the money pouring into campaigns this year, millions and millions and millions. One person writing a $5 million check, a $10 million check, and, and how it's distorting things. So being the swing vote, and often, like on President Clinton's budget, 11 Democrats on the committee, 9 Republicans, they had to get it out of the committee. And uh, so I said, nah, I think I'm going to vote no. 
Now, if I had voted no, it would have been a 10 to 10 tie. What would have happened to the bill? What would have happened to the bill? On a 10 to 10 tie. Any of you remember Robert Rule's order? Same as the Senate precedents. If it's a tie, it loses. You have to, in order to advance a bill forward, you have to get a majority of those voting. So if it's a 10 to 10 tie, now if I just had voted, it would have been 10 to 9 and it would have passed. But if I was joined the 9 and it became 10, 10 to 10, it didn't pass. So I had, an, I had the ability, just because of how I believed, and I believed he was doing uh, too many uh, tax increases compared to the number of spending cuts that he had. I was fighting for a one-to-one -one ratio, and uh, he, he didn't have that in his budget, so I refused to let it come out. So we had days and days and days of negotiating, of me called down to the White House, and them saying, you know, what's it going to take to change your mind? And so finally I came up with several things, getting the ratio at one-to-one, -one and uh, doing away with an energy tax that was going to not be on energy producers, it was going to be on everything produced in the United States, because everything that's produced has an energy component, so it was like a sales tax on energy, so to speak. So I got that taken out. I got some more cuts put in and some other taxes taken out, and then I voted it out of committee. Then they pulled a fast one on me, and they put all the things back in it that I didn't like in committee, and they put them back in it on the floor, especially over in the House side. So when it came back from the House, I filibustered against the bill, and uh, um, we came within one vote of, of, of killing the bill, then on the final vote, it was a 50 to 50 tie on the Senate floor. Um, and um, not a single Republican having voted for Clinton's first budget, and several Democrats, including myself, had voted against it. So what happened in that case? Did it die on the 50 50 tie on the Senate floor? No. Why not? Vice President Gore, the Vice President, only has a vote in case of a tie in the Senate, so it was 50 to 50, so the Vice President broke the tie, and the budget became law. And then the Democrats lost the next election for Congress. They lost control of Congress overwhelmingly, and Newt Gingrich became the Speaker. And Clinton <coughs> afterwards said it, it all happened because I didn't present a bipartisan <coughs> budget. I presented a very partisan budget that passed without a single Republican vote, and when you do that, you're not able usually to sustain what it is you pass very long. So sure enough, some of these things were overturned in the next Congress. But but you became, I was on every news show. I couldn't be on all of these shows. I mean, I, I was doing like 10 of them. And because I was the swing vote. And, uh, and how often you get to be the swing vote in the House or really the person that's controlling the outcome of the debate? Almost never, because the committees are so large. And also, party discipline is much stronger in the House than it is in the Senate. And then the style of debate is totally different. You know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna if I'm gonna debate and I'm standing up here in front of you, uh, do you all need seats? By the way, are there any seats? Are you sure? Okay. All right. Well, uh, but uh, I'm gonna get up and I'm, I may be really, really uh, bombastic. You know, and I, I may get up here and I may point my finger at Mr. Bell and I'm gonna, I say, you know, Mr. Bell, you know, and I could address him like that and just to him, you know you're lying? You know that when you stood up here you lied to the House? You liar? It's reprehensible how you lie. Now, if you said that, and I'm a long way away from him, by the way, or I wouldn't be saying this, uh, <laughs> but if, 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 you know, in the House, it gets very personal if you've watched the House of Representatives on, on television. Now, if that were in the Senate, then I get, first of all, if I just pointed my finger at him, let alone called his name, you know, Representative Bell, if I said, you know, mm -mm. the gavel would have pounded down, they would have brought the sergeant at arms in, and they would have escorted me away. The, the presiding officer, the Speaker of the House, or whoever was presiding, would say, you know, the representative, Mr. Boren, is out of order. Uh, not in the house. You can do that. You can point your finger. You can yell, shout. You can stomp around, and so on. Now, if you're in the Senate, you know I, I'm standing right by you. Here's your desk, and my desk is right here. And I don't go down to the front to speak. I speak only from beside my desk. 
or if I were if I were back here, I would just be standing by you. You know, you'd be a senator, I'd be a senator. We'd be our desk not quite as close together as as you all have your desk, but almost. So you know, first of all, I wouldn't be yelling and screaming more or less, talking at the top of my lungs. Let's say you and I are debating each other, and you've just debated, and I. And by the way, in the Senate, um, you you never call the other person by name. Um, you refer to my distinguished colleague from the state of Oregon. Are you from Oklahoma? Where are you from? You're from Oklahoma. Okay. I would say my distinguished colleague from Oklahoma has um, has just uh, um, told us some things that we really need to think about and examine as to their accuracy. And then, uh, and instead of saying you are a liar. You know, well, you should come here and lie to us like First of all, I wouldn't point my finger at you. I'd be just standing here in a very gentlemanly fashion, and I would say, I regret to say that my distinguished colleague from Oklahoma has not spoken in accordance with the facts. I can only hope that it was inadvertent on her part and not deliberate. So what have I really said? She's lying. She probably knew she was lying. But I have said it in a very, very nice way, right? So if you listen to, you see the House and the Senate, and just because you're standing next to each other while you're talking, Howard Metzenbaum of Ohio, and I used to always disagree with him on oil and gas issues. I always wondered why he just hated oil and gas producers. And uh, I found out later it's because when he was 23, he worked for an oil and gas company, which I won't name, but it was founded in Oklahoma. And, and they fired him on the spot, even took the keys away from his company car and he had to call a taxi and leave in the middle of the day. Well, he hated oil companies ever after that. And so he was always against me. I was trying to represent, obviously, being from Oklahoma, you're pretty much for oil and gas production or royalty owners. There are about half a million of us that own little squidges of mineral interest that maybe our families once owned the farm or something like that. And a lot of independent producers and all that's just like there are a lot of ranchers and there are a lot of wheat producers and so on. So generally, if you're an Oklahoma senator, you're for the things that are important to your own economy. So it was really helpful because Senator Metzenbaum couldn't see very well. And he never spoke off the cuff. Uh, most of my speeches on there, I just got up and talked. And he didn't. He always had it sort of written out. And he had to have it written out in a big, bold type huge letters because he couldn't see very well through his glasses. So I could sit there, it was sort of fun sometimes, because I would say, now I know what my good friend from Ohio is likely to say, because I could look right here and see what he was going to say next, and I would say, he will probably uh, tell you that such and such, such and such, and he'd be looking down at his notes, and that is what he was going to say. So, you know, it led, it led to a lot of a lot of levity at times in terms of uh, knowing what, knowing what, but the house is very different. You've got a desk in the Senate, your individual desk in front of you, you're just sitting in chairs uh, that don't even have um, anything in front of you to write on and that sort of thing. It's very much more um, impersonal. So it's very, very different, the house and the Senate. Um, another thing that is, um, uh, and so house members also, it's, it's often said that the, the space between a TV camera and a member of the House in Washington is really a dangerous zone because House members will scramble all over themselves to get in front of the television camera first. And the senators sort of, it's, well, I'm going to get my share of the publicity. I'm not going to worry about it so much. So it's a very, it's a very different sort of thing. The other thing is, anyone know another difference between the House and the Senate? We'll go back to this one and go through how a bill becomes law. Yes? Age difference, yes, 35 and 30. But as a matter of fact, usually by the time you run statewide, instead of just in one congressional district, you're usually older. You've been in politics. It's sort of viewed as working your way up. Uh, uh, maybe you've been in the House first and the state legislature, and then you finally run for the U.S. Senate or governor statewide. So they tend to be older. Not only is it required by law, but they tend to be older. They tend to be older. Yeah. Any thoughts? Uh, term, term length. Term length. Oh, yes. Two years in the House, <laughs> six years in the Senate. I mean, you just start running for re-election the day that you get elected in the House. Uh, 
two years is not a long time to raise the amount of money you need to raise. Any more in a house race, even in Oklahoma, you probably need to raise a million and a half dollars to two million dollars. In the Senate, you need to raise six to eight million dollars. And so if you just have two years to raise that, say two million dollars, you've got to start raising it every day and really get with it the very first time. The sad thing is, we've talked about the influence of money in politics, but many, many newly elected House members have their first fundraiser in Washington particularly raising money from people who didn't support them, who now want to get on the good side because they won. You know, they were probably supporting the person that was in office. And if you pulled an upset and knocked them off, they probably didn't give you any money, so they're anxious to have a fundraiser for you and get on your good side and hope you'll forget that they weren't for you when you were running. So the sad thing is that before many members, before they cast their first vote ever after being elected, have several fundraisers. Now that really is a commentary on our, on our political system and what the influence of money has done to really corrupt the system. Is it because you're a bad person that you want to do this? Is it you want to have a fundraiser first? No, it's not because you're a bad person. It's just the reality, isn't it? You know that you're going to have to raise a whole lot of money if you're going to have a chance to win. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's something that you're in a full-time campaign. And if you're going to raise the amount of money, for example, to run in a really contested, let's say, governor's race, Senate race, maybe it's $8 million, are you likely that you can raise most of it in Oklahoma? I would say that people running for the Senate, for example, uh, spend probably half their time at fundraisers outside the state. They're in Miami, they're in New York several times, they're in Chicago, they're in Los Angeles, they're in San Francisco, you know, various. Dallas. Um, there's probably almost as much of Texas money given to Oklahoma candidates as there is Oklahoma uh, money given to Oklahoma candidates. So you sort of, what, what about grassroots democracy, you wonder? Because they're campaigning all the time. Um, what else? Length of the term. What's another difference between the houses? Yeah. The yeah, house is more locally oriented. More locally oriented, yeah, I would say so. You're because you're probably not known as a nationwide spokesperson on something. Maybe you're, maybe you get to know as a national spokesperson on campaign reform, or on tax policy, or Mr. or Ms. National Defense, or whatever. Um, but generally, the House members just know for how well they do in their district, how well they take care of their district. Yes. Why, why do they need fundraisers in a different state than one they're trying to? Well, because you can't raise enough money in Oklahoma. Like, why would someone donate money? Like, what interest do they have in? Oh, so if you're a hedge fund run, uh, uh, operator, and right now hedge fund money, if you make hedge fund profits on hedge funds, you have a much lower tax rate under the tax laws than you do, let's just say, you working. Are you making a profit manufacturing? Are you making a profit in farming or whatever it is? It's a, there are so many tax breaks for hedge funds that are specific to hedge funds and some other Wall Street derivatives and some other Wall Street uh, tools for making money, for example, in the financial industry. So uh, it doesn't matter whether I live in California or New York, if you're going to be in the House or Senate, I want you to vote for my tax break, right? So I'm just as concerned about that. I don't care how well you represent your district in Oklahoma. I don't care if you ever set foot in your district no home, but if you're a sure vote for me on my hedge fund tax break, I'm for you, and I'll write a big check. Whereas that farmer who comes to your bean dinner might give you a, buy a ten dollar ticket at the door, maybe, or five dollars. That's one of the reasons I felt so strongly. I never would take money from a political action committee. I never received a dollar from a political action committee, only from individuals and primarily from inside the state of Oklahoma. I had a college roommate who lived in Pennsylvania. If I had friends or people that really knew me or people that really believed in me from other states, I would I would take some contributions from them. But most of it was local. So I remember the night, the last time I ran for the Senate, uh, Mrs. Bourne and I went to this workshop. And both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party had them, and they said um, the workshop was how to how to become. How to get reelected without having a single grassroots volunteer. Because when I ran, 
like for governor, as Johnny knows, I had everybody I had was a volunteer. I mean, there were all these people licking back then, licking stamps and envelopes for direct mail down at my headquarters or getting up at five in the morning on election day and putting doorknob hangers, you know, to vote for me on people's doors or knocking doors for me. We'd map out where all we'd been. I was doing some of that myself. I was walking with my broom from town to town and campaigning and getting free media because I couldn't afford to buy it. And who's that guy running around the state with a broom? You know, uh, who walked from Idabel to Broken Bow with a broom, who walked from Ardmore to Medill with a broom, or, uh, you know, from Lawton to uh, wherever, Altus to Blair. I mean, you know, so I, I was doing this all over the state. Uh, Muskogee to Fort Gibson, different places you all know. And, and but all my people were, they were all active and they were, Women having teas for me all over the place. There were guys having early morning coffees for me all over the place. You know, it was just, it was re retail campaigning. So they, but now they were telling you, one, how you never need to leave your air conditioned office to campaign. They told the story of this one senator who was sort of elderly. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have had enough energy to have gotten out of campaign. He had not one volunteer. Every single person who worked on his campaign were paid. Every single one of them that was a jock. They were paid to work for him. They had, you know, you can buy software and you can buy people that set up phone banks. Everything's so sophisticated now, they can call everybody. They know if you're a college student. They know if you're getting financial aid, let's say. So they might make calls to you, automated calls. We've all gotten these robo calls that, that just talk to you and said, we, you know, it, we just wanted to let you know that David Warren, as your senator, is very concerned about your federal financial aid, your Pell Grants, and all these things for you to go to college. And he has fought for this, and he voted for it on this date and that date. And if you want to keep him there working to keep your scholarships intact, vote for Warren. They would have it down because they'd know that was your interest. Maybe your interest is something else. Maybe you're pro-life, or maybe you're pro-choice, or maybe you're whatever it is. They, they have enough data on you that now they do that. And they know just to hit you. So you can stay in your air conditioned office, your quote mailings, or your phone banks, or all this are with people that you paid. So all you have to do is just raise the sufficient amount of money to pay all these people to do all these things. And in this case, the senator, it was really interesting. There, was, there were two huge public events in his state during the, during the fall. And uh, the only thing he did was ride in two parades. The two parades that were the biggest two parades, it'd be like riding the 89er day parade or got three or something. And, and, and that was all he did. That was his whole campaign. And he had no volunteers, he had only paid employees, and used all the technology that he paid for. And of course ran lots of television along with the rest of it. And with what he, of course, now would be on the web and other ways you campaign or Facebook or anything else. But he did all that. It did not nothing that you would really call it. He had only volunteers, mainly college students when I first ran for governor, mainly college students. Because I was 33 years old and people sort of said, well, that's neat. We want to have a really young governor. And, and I've got pictures. There are pictures in the union of my, uh, my rallies. And a lot of crazy things were done. One of my opponents did a dirty stunt. It was right here on this campus. He knew I was going to be speaking on the campus. The one that's a picture in the union. You'll love the hairstyles, especially for the guys, which were like this uh, at that time. And uh, he got some of his supporters, and they flew over in a plane, and they parachuted out. And with, with my opponent's literature and flags, landed on the ground with their flags, you know, it was really fun. I just said, well, you can see they're all bailing out of their campaign. Uh, it didn't really turned out to be good for me uh, that they tried to, tried to disrupt my speech by all this stuff. But, I mean, just think about that. And then they said, how do you raise the money? Well, mainly it comes from the PAC. That time he got like 92% of all of his campaign money, 8% from his home study, 92% from organized groups, mainly lobbyists, in Washington. And you could hold a big fundraiser, they could give $10,000. Of course now, with the Supreme Court ruling, you can give a million dollars if you wanted to, to a super PAC. And they would get together and he would say, okay, first you go to the banker's PAC. And you say, here's the poll, shows he's gonna win. 
and then you go across the street, so get on board. So they get on board. At that time, the insurance companies were trying to get partly into what used to be called the banking business. The banks at least viewed it was their business. And so you go tell the insurance company pack, well, the bankers just gave, you know, he's going to win, he's going to remember, do you want him just to remember the bankers gave but the insurance pack didn't? No, the insurance pack ponies up, and you keep doing that. You know? Well, the business group gave, so by the labor unions better give, and so on and so forth. And by the time you're through, you've raised a whole lot of money playing one interest group against the other. They taught, they taught us, it was like a course, and how to do all these things, and at the end of it, this great guy who got only 8% of his contributions from his home state, who had not one volunteer, who made only two public appearances, who bought and paid for everything else because he had this huge war chest, gets reelected with 60% of the vote. Against somebody who raised their money at the grassroots, who had real volunteers, who was really trying to make a race of it for the people who live in that state. So my wife and I on the way home from it, first of all, we both agreed we wanted to go home and take a bath. Uh, after hearing all of that, because we thought it was such a distortion of the system, we said, "Well, we're not going to, we're not going to do it. We're not going to take any PAC money." It was the last time I ran, and we thought, so far I'd gotten by without doing it, and there was just me and one other senator at that time who were not taking any. And so we said, "We'll have to do a whole lot of events in Oklahoma, because you could raise four or five hundred thousand dollars in one night easily without even much work in Washington." But think of how much, how long it would take you to raise four or five hundred thousand dollars in Oklahoma at Bean Dinners and Fort Gibson and Oolaga and Blair and you know, Laverne or places like that. So it would take a lot of nights that you'd be on the road. So I said, are you willing to do it with me? And we'll do it that way because that's what it ought to be. So we did. And fortunately, I didn't have a real strong opponent. Um, so. I got 83% of the vote. Got 81% of the Republican votes and 83% of the Democratic votes. So, but th that won't ever happen again. It wouldn't happen for me because we're so polarized today uh, that people, if they just see a D or R, an R after a name, they don't look at the individual situation or what the individual has done. So a lot of things have changed. Another big difference between the House and the Senate, time limits. Anyone know what I mean by that? Time limits between the House and the Senate. It's a huge difference in terms of how the two operate. Um, anyone know that? How long you can speak on a subject? How long you can speak on a subject? How long can you speak in the House of Representatives? Like under an hour, maybe. Under an hour, maybe. Well, it depends on the bill. Because in the House of Representatives, they have what's called the Rules Committee. We'll get back to that. And the Rules Committee which, in essence, the Speaker appoints the majority, whoever's the Speaker of the members of the Rules Committee. For every bill that comes up, they give it a place on the schedule. And so they may say, this bill can be debated, the whole bill, not more than an hour, <coughs> maybe it's two hours, maybe it's four hours, uh, maybe it's two days. But usually they'll say this bill can only be debated for, like, say, four hours maximum. It could, could be a lot shorter than that. Could be one hour. And those that are for it, they'll, be, they'll name one person. Will be the floor manager, usually the, the author, the one in favor of the bill. You're given 30 minutes. The one opposed to the bill, people opposed, they'll name a leader for the opposition. Gets 30 minutes. So at the end of that time, what happens at the end of that hour, for example? You vote. Up or down on the bill or up and down on the amendment, right? So in the House, you it just happens automatically. Everything, by the way, is done by majority vote in the House. So right now, the Republicans have total control, really, of the House. Mr. Boehner has very strong control as the Speaker, controls the Rules Committee. So I'm, I'm in favor of the bill. You're one of the people speaking for me. And I'll say, I yield seven minutes you know, to my colleague from Oklahoma to speak on this subject. So at the end of your seven or eight minutes, what do you have to do? Sit down. Yeah, sit down. Now, in the Senate, is there any limit on how long I can talk? Is there any rules committee which sets the schedule for bills? However long you can stand up. However long you can stand up. And what if I decide, for example, on President Clinton's budget, which I disagreed with uh, the last time it came around, um, I, I started speaking. 
and spoke and spoke and spoke. And after about 11 hours of speaking, uh, I turned it over to my friend, who was also on my side, and he spoke for another eight hours. And then I turned it over to my other colleague who was in with me on our side, and she spoke for another uh, 16 hours. You know, I mean, we just kept going. Now, how can you stop that in the, in the, in the Senate? Hmm? A supermajority. A supermajority of the Senate has to vote to stop the debate. You have to file a motion, you have to wait a certain number of days, which I'll go back over, and then you can stop the debate. So, um, what, what is that supermajority, by the way? Two-thirds of the members of the Senate, 67 votes. So, if you really want to stop something, even though a majority is for it, and a majority is ready to vote for it, let's say 55 senators are ready to vote for it. And 55 senators want you to sit down, you've had days of doing this, and if you've got you know, 25 people working with you, you can just keep the microphone, you know, never giving up. You can just keep this thing going. And you can get into all sorts of things. You know, I mean, when I was debating, for example, and you can hold up a nomination in the, in the, in the Senate, because the Senate generally has to consent, not the House. Not the House. The House does not confirm nominees to the Cabinet, for example or to the U.S. Supreme Court, for example, or to be generals of the Army or admirals of the Navy. All those people who come for before the Senate, the President appoints them, but they don't take those offices till they have been confirmed, right, by two-thirds majority of the Senate. So President Reagan, for example, and sometimes you can filibuster. It doesn't even have anything to do with the person. You can filibuster. President Reagan, we had a bill, people were desperate in Oklahoma. We had motorcades of farmers, they were losing their farms. And President Reagan uh, vetoed a bill, which I and some others had passed, to give relief and let farmers restructure in bankruptcy like businesses can and save their farms, their family farms. A lot of them have been in their farms, their farms have been in their families for generations. They were losing them. And part of it was because the federal uh, home Loan Bank for Farmers uh, didn't, wasn't capitalized enough to continue those loans. So we had a bill to save the farmers from foreclosure. The president vetoed it. We passed it again with some modifications that we thought would satisfy him. He vetoed it again. Then all of a sudden, um, he nominated Mr. Ed Meese, who was a good friend of him, his, had been his legal counsel when he was governor of California. Nice guy. I knew him. I liked him. We'd even gone to dinner together a few times. Got along great. He nominated him to be Attorney General. So, what did I do? Came up to, they came up, brought up, the floor leader brought it up. Uh, now propose that we give uh, our uh, assent and agreement, and confirm Mr. Meese to be Attorney General of the United States. So, and if you remember the House, you couldn't do this. Because House members don't have power of confirmation. The confirmation of the cabinet, like the Attorney General, doesn't come to the House, only to the Senate. That's another thing to remember, the power of confirmation. And the fact also that there are no time limits on me. So I started to speak. And I wasn't speaking about Mr. Meese. I said about three or four things about Mr. Meese. <coughs> Mr. Meese is a fine man. And I know that he's qualified to be Attorney General. And I understand why the president appointed him. But before we take up this, this appointment, we need to get some other business done. We need to save all these family farmers in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska, and by the way, and all those other states, you know, Alabama, every place there were farmers, a lot of farmers, all those senators, Democrat and Republican, were on my side. So I started talking. And so I talked about the farm issues for about six hours. And when I ran out of that, I got the Washington, D.C. phone book, and I started down, and I said, if all these people that I'm going to name now knew about why the president had vetoed this bill for these poor farmers, and I started reading every name in the phone book. And I brought all sorts of other books to read. Uh, I had piled up, just for a fact, you know, like 25 books piled up on my little tiny desk, which made it very clear that I planned to speak for a long time. And, and finally, I remember it was over Thanksgiving, because I was at my mother-in-law's house uh, for Thanksgiving dinner, 
and she calls in, and Edwin Meese was, was the man's name, who became Attorney General. She came in, and just as we were having dessert, she said, David, I hate to bother you, there's some guy from Washington named Ed is on the phone for you <laughs> on Thanksgiving Day. And I got on the phone, and it was Ed Meese, you know, and I said, oh, Ed, I'm very sorry this is all going on, but I said, I just can't yield, even though we're great friends. I just can't yield. This is terrible. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of farmers suffering and needlessly, and this could be restructured, and they could come back, which they later did. So this went on. I said, we've got another bill introduced. The president has his chance. The minute he passes that bill, we'll, we'll confirm you. So on Monday, I got back to the office, and this melodious voice, always very melodious voice, and you couldn't help but like him, even when you were really mad at him, which I was, said, David? I said, yes. And he said, this is wrong. Right. And uh, I said, oh, Mr. President, uh, nice to hear your voice. And he said, you know, David, this is just not right, what you're doing to poor Ed. He deserves to be confirmed. And I said, well, Mr. President, I understand that. But I said, I haven't been able to get you to read and consider this farm bill. And, and all these farmers deserve help, thousands and thousands of them. How would you feel? If you, it was your family's farm. You've been there. I know you're a compassionate man. And I, you just need to rethink this. And he said, well, David, that's why I'm calling you. I had our people restudy it. And I think we had misunderstood something like your farm bill. You and I, Senator Dole was one of my small, he named two or three others that were with me. And he said, I just want you to know that I'm going to sign your bill. You just get it down here to me, and I'm going to sign it. And then, then do you think we can have Mr. Meese to be our Attorney General? I said, well, Mr. President, that's just, that's yes, absolutely. You have an agreement. I'm shaking hands with you on the telephone. And I said, uh, uh, the only thing I want to do is make sure there's no slip-ups here. So as soon as you sign this bill, and the message has been sent to me that you've signed it and not vetoed it, then I'll move myself to bring up Mr. Meese's <coughs> confirmation. That happened about 30 minutes later. The bill was signed, and uh, uh, I moved the confirmation of Mr. Meese to be Attorney General. And about five minutes later, it was done by unanimous consent. So all the senators. So um, anyway, uh, being, there's a huge difference between a House member and a senator. You cannot. I couldn't have done that or used that leverage because I wouldn't have had the ability to confirm people. The other thing I wouldn't have the ability, because only half senators confirm major appointments, the other thing is, with the time limitations in the House, how much leverage would I have had just to be able to hold it up for 30 minutes or whatever the House Rules Committee might have given me? Not much. So that's, that's another power. Time limits on speeches, very important. The filibuster, the ability to filibuster in the Senate, but not in the House. You have to stick, you have to, stick to the time limit in the House. <laughs> And also, what about amendments to bills when they come on the House floor? Can you present any amendments you want to? No. It has to be germane. Write this down. G-E-R-M-A-N-E. -E. We'll come back to that. It means it has to do with the subject matter of the bill. And you also have to get approval of the Rules Committee to offer an amendment. The Rules Committee may just say, we're going to take up this bill, and you can't offer any amendments to it. You're just going to have to vote up or down, and you've got an hour to debate it, 30 minutes on each side, and you have to vote up or down. In the Senate, there is no germaneness rule. That means you can amend any bill with any amendment you want to put on it, even if it doesn't have anything to do with the bill in front of the Senate. So I could take a bill on agriculture and put a school prayer amendment on it, or uh, an abortion amendment on it, or anything I wanted to do, or a capital punishment amendment on it. So if I'm trying to slow down a bill, I can really throw a bombshell out there, can't I? I can think of the most controversial thing I can think about, and I can offer it as an amendment to a bill, and I can bring the bill to a screeching halt, because now we're going to debate the amendment. And by the way, you can filibuster on the amendment, too. So they might never even get back to the first bill. So a huge difference. Uh, another difference, what about treaties? Like one of the most famous treaties in recent times was the Panama Canal Treaty, in which the United States agreed to give the Panama Canal Zone 
and the canal back to Panama. It was the property of the United States government. We ruled the zone, ruled strip of land <coughs> which passed. But, um, uh, Panama was even sort of a creation of the United States as a country, which uh, broke off from, I think, Honduras, uh, or Nicaragua, Honduras. And, and the United States, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, just sort of took that, <coughs> you might say stole that, from the people in the area, now, now the government of Panama, and, and ran it all these years as a matter of national interest. So we had a huge debate. Should we give Panama back to the Panamanians? And that became a huge debate. But was the House involved in that debate? No. They just sat on the sidelines waiting for the Senate to finish their debate. Because they do not ratify treaties. Again, by two, two thirds vote. They do not ratify treaties. Only the Senate votes on ratifying treaties. And it became a huge issue in Oklahoma because Senator Bellman, who was in office then, thought we should ratify the treaty and give the Panama Canal back to the Panamanians. He thought it was safer because they had all these terrorist groups, nationalist <coughs> groups, that had grown up in Panama that said, well, the United States stole it from us. We want it back. And if they don't give it back, we're going to destroy it as terrorists. We're going to blow up parts of it. We're going to do all sorts of things. And so Bellman said, well, if we want to we want it to be safe and keep the shipping lines open for the United States or for our Navy to go back and forth for it, we, we better reach an agreement with the Panamanians and either sort of phase in giving them back so control. So that passed by about one or two vote margin in the Senate. And uh, Mr. Gaylord, who was then the publisher of the, the Data of Oklahoma, had done some military tour of duty in Panama, and he thought it was terrible that we were giving away the Panama Canal, so to speak. We stole it fair and square, and we ought to be able to keep it. And besides, it was key to our national interest to keep the Panama Canal. So that became a huge issue in the Senate only. The House spared it. It's just like they don't get involved in confirming Supreme Court justices or members of the cabinet. Uh, they don't get involved with treaties. And there were 100, 100 front page editorials uh, 100 days in a row uh, saying Senator Bellman should be recalled as senator if he voted for that. That's prior to the vote. And there was even a day when they asked everyone in Oklahoma to turn on their headlights if they were against the Panama Canal Treaty. Uh, the day Oklahoma asked that. And I forgot what day it was, but about half the headlights in Oklahoma were on that day. And Bellman, there were all these billboards went up, bye bye Bellman, gave away the Panama Canal you know, we're going to bring him home, not be our senator anymore. So he didn't run for re-election at that time. Later, came back and was re-elected governor. But it's a huge thing, huge fight. So, so you know, what happens, what happens there is, is, is uh, uh, very different, very different. Also, uh, the, the House does have one power, at least in the Constitution. In theory, the House has, we've talked about all these powers that the Senate has, confirm nominees like Supreme Court, like cabinet, ratify treaties, be involved in foreign policy a great deal, and so on. There's one thing that the House is, one power the House is supposed to have instead of the Senate. Anyone know what that is? Yes. Originate tax bills. Yeah. They're supposed to originate all bills having to do with taxes. And is that in fact a real, and we're taught that in high school and so on, is that in fact a really important power? No. First of all, for a tax bill to come off, or any bill to come off, both, both houses have to vote on it. Now both houses don't vote on treaties, both houses don't vote on confirming nominees. The bills that are going to become law, both houses have to vote on it. So, for example, the largest tax bill in recent history was the Reagan tax bill, which rewrote the entire tax law. And he did away with a lot of exemptions and special tax breaks, and then he greatly lowered the tax rate on the top rate. Now, George W. Bush has done anyone better. The Reagan tax cuts were considered to be revolutionary at the time, and George W., during the war, we were running up billions of dollars a year in cost of the Iraq war, he cut taxes more. He did, he did the rate of them better and cut them about 20 or 30 percent more on the top rate. 
which again caused more of the income in the country to go to the top 1%, less to the middle class, for example. But he, that was the bigger, but, but in sheer terms of the tax cut, he, Reagan changed the whole tax cut. You know, the bill, the bill was introduced in the House, and by the way, there's the House Ways and it's kind of a rivalry between the House and Senate, and House members get so they kind of resent senators, well you can imagine, because they get most of the publicity, they're playing in the action on treaties and confirmations more than the House, and on and on and on, so they, you know, at this time there was a chairman of the House uh, Taxation Committee, which is known as the Ways and Means Committee in the House, and the Senate Finance Committee, which is the Senate Tax Committee, and there were two real characters. Senator Russell Long of Louisiana, the son of the famous Kingfish, Huey Long, who was came the closest to being a dictator of any state than any governor ever ever was. He really totally controlled Louisiana for a number of years. That was his father. Russell was a very colorful character, brilliant guy. And Rostenkowski, who was the chairman of the House Taxation Committee, he later spent some time living at public expense. His meals were all paid for. Uh, he didn't have the freedom to go anywhere. He was in a nice correctional facility for taking bribes uh, to pass and kill bills. Uh, so he, he spent part of his later years uh, behind bars. He was a colorful character, to say the least, from Chicago. And uh, so he was all excited. The House was going to start this big debate on the tax bill. And he was going to be the center of attention his committee was going to be the center of attention. The House was going to have its day in the sun because this huge tax bill was up. It was just the big focus of everything, Reagan's tax bill. Well, he's getting ready to hold his first hearings. Meanwhile, there was a, there was a little tiny bill that was like five lines long. And by the way, when you have a bill that starts in the House, it has a high, an H number on it, like H200. House Bill 200. It starts in the Senate, it has an S number in front of it, like S200. So could you have a tax bill start with an S number on it? No, it has to start in the House, right? That's what we said, the Constitution says so. So they introduced, uh, while they were getting ready to introduce this big Reagan tax bill, they introduced, there was a little one-page bill, and several of us went to the same church, the Foundry Methodist Church, which was about 10 blocks up from the White House, and like Senator Dole, the Republican leader, Senator Congressman Livingston from Louisiana, who was the Republican whip of the House, me, there were several of us, all introduced this bill because we had bought a new church bell for our church, the bell tower. The old bell had gotten cracks in it and couldn't ring very well. So we got, and we bought it, we had it cast in Holland. Well, say we paid $10,000 for the bell or $20,000 for the bell. It's a massive bell. And, but the tax on it, there was a tariff on bells made outside the United States. Well, the tax was like $200,000 on this poor little $20,000 bell. And of course, it was going to cost the church all this money. So those of us in Congress that were members of the church got together and we decided we'd get a bill passed that exempted that church bill from taxes. From, from tariffs, duties on it. So we introduced a simple little bell that on any church, if a bell was intended for use by any public institution, I don't think we could even say church, public institution, located within 10 miles of the U.S. Capitol building, that, uh, that it would be exempt, because you had to, couldn't just say the founder of the United Methodist Church bell won't be taxed, you had to make it generic. So all bells for institutions located within 10 miles of the U.S. Capitol building, which were due to be rung at certain times during the week, et cetera, would be exempt from taxation. We introduced it over in the uh, House. And the House, of course, immediately passed it. There were like half the members of the Taxation Committee were members of the Founder of the United Methodist Church. So it passed. A little tiny one-pager. Comes over to the Senate. Where does it get assigned in the Senate? Which committee? The taxation committee, right? Because this is, has to do with taxing bells. Gets it in there, and old Russell Long, who gets up early in the morning, he all of a sudden would get it in the committee, 
it's read in committee, the first day that it's read, he said, I hereby amend this little bill on the church bells. But after the last word on the first page, there were like five lines on the first page, add the following. His amendment added the entire 2,000 page tax bill that President Reagan had put before Congress and had been just introduced in the House. And then he announced, so now we've got the whole tax bill before us. It hasn't even been assigned to committee in the House yet. So he's done an end run around the House. And the little one-page bill has a 2,000-page amendment that changes the whole tax code of the United States. And then he announced, because he had already been working up, we will get our public hearings on this bill tomorrow morning, and we have two panels already scheduled. I urge all members to be in attendance. So the TV cameras <laughs> were all ready to be on poor Rostenkowski and his committee and on the House of Representatives all said, whoops, tomorrow the whole thing's starting. And guess where? In the Senate. In the Senate Taxation Committee. So for weeks and weeks and weeks, all the attention was on the Senate Finance Committee and the Senate as they were debating the tax bill. So does it really matter very much? No. What the Senate does, the Senate just looks around like Russell Long did and says, let me find an H bill number that has something to do with taxes. I'll get it and I'll make it a really big important bill on taxes and we'll keep control of tax policy, not those lowly households. So that's really the way it works uh, in fact. So some of, these, some of these things, some of these differences between the House and Senate can be very important, like treaties and confirmations. Some are very important, like the time limits or the ability to offer amendments uh, in the House. And some of them that here they could be important, like all tax bills at a certain House, turn out not to be very important at all. Now next time, I'm going to start us on how a bill really becomes law. You know, not what you learned in kindergarten or junior high or high school, uh, but how does it really become? We'll talk about that. Uh, really see the difference.